Proverbs chapter 1. I want to start where we started this series out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's Proverbs 1 verse 7. And it says this, and this is really kind of the, the linchpin for all of the Proverbs. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. We often think of that word fear as being afraid of, but we started out with the understanding it's not to be afraid of. It's an understanding the awe of who God is, that everything flows and starts with him. And we begin with really this foundational principle that wisdom only finds its purpose when it stays connected to the source of wisdom. Today, I wanna pivot to the idea of what does it look like to be a lifelong learner? I wanna take some time today. There's really a theme that develops as you read the Proverbs. In fact, 26 of the 31 Proverbs talk about the idea of learning or being teachable. And so today I want us to kind of unpack what does it mean for us to be teachable? One of the attributes of a disciple is that they're teachable. And all of us should be in this process of becoming disciples. Proverbs 4, 7 says, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. A lifelong learner is about us being teachable in all of the spheres or areas of our life, in our marriage, in our work, whether we're the boss or the employee. I mean, know that even if you're the boss, every boss has a boss, right? Those spheres of our life. As a Christ follower, those of you the younger, the students in the room, give a shout out to our youth section up in the balcony. Right on, they're awake up there. Yell at me if you fall asleep, all right? And maybe not. You got me, all right, perfect. So being a lifelong learner is this, this reality that we have a desire to be teachable. I said just a moment ago, 26 of the 31 chapters of Proverbs in some way deal with this idea. Often learning stops because we stop listening and we only talk. We only give our own input. I was listening to a leadership podcast recently and they were interviewing a man by the name of Greg Sankey. He's the commissioner of the SEC. It's a football conference and he's really got this pretty incredible place of leadership. They have like, oh, they make like a billion dollars a year. It's crazy. But uh, because of that, he now has this public platform and they were asking him about leadership. And they just simply said, if you would share one thing about leadership, what would it be if you gave one, just one nugget of wisdom? And he said this, and I thought it was really good. He said, he said learn to listen more. He said, one of the things I've found as my leadership has increased I've had the ability to then be surrounded by even better leaders. And when I get into those places, I've, I've really focused on using an economy of words to make eye contact and to listen. In fact, he has an incredibly busy schedule and he said often after he has opportunities to be in a room with another great leader, he will set aside time to go and sit, to think, and to take notes over what he recalls from that meeting. During the meeting, he just he wants to be able to make eye contact and, and listen and, and soak in. There's a principle there for us as believers in what it means to be teachable. He said, I would listen more. One of the things that we see with people that are, that are unteachable is that being a person who's not willing to be taught means that you've placed a lid on your ability to learn. Now get it, I, I get it. I, as a kid, I hated school, right? But I began to learn as I got older that there were things that I enjoyed. There are things I wanted to know more about. And so I want the Holy Spirit to continue teaching me. Proverbs 10, eight says this, the wise are glad to be instructed, but babbling fools fall flat on their faces. The writer of Proverbs gives a number of examples of people who are unteachable. And I wanna give you a few of those before we jump into the meat of the message today. Let me just say this. The next couple minutes is a no elbow zone. <laughs> that is you are not allowed to elbow your neighbor when I say one of these, because you're gonna recognize some of them, right? So what does the writer of Proverbs say? Proverbs, Proverbs says this, that someone who's unteachable is someone that knows it all. In fact, no matter what the subject is, they know something about it. And they are here to let you know what it is that they know. <laughs> hey, I said no elbows, right? Yeah. I see some going around the room. I 
So instead of elbowing, I see some people doing like the finger pointing thing. <laughs> Check what the writer of Proverbs said, Proverbs 28, 16. Those who trust their own insight are foolish, but anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. How about this one? I know this is one that, uh, man, can be a struggle. The, the, the person who always has to be right, right? The writer of Proverbs would say, that if you always have to be right, it puts you in a place of being unteachable. Proverbs chapter 18, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eye, but a wise man listens to advice. How about the person who only listens to their own voice? Listen, I hope that you've come to that place of understanding that you don't have the sole source of all wisdom. And yet sometimes the unteachable person acts that way. Proverbs 18, 12 says, the fool takes no pleasure in understanding but only in expressing his opinion. And maybe the, quite possibly the, the, the hardest part of being unteachable is the person who is offended when corrected. Not just doesn't receive correction, but allows themselves to be offended when they are corrected. Proverbs 12.1, let's put this up on the screen. And... Uh, this is one of those ones I'm gonna make you read with me and I'm gonna see if you do what the first couple services did. Uh, just when I pause, I want you to read the word for me. Whoever loves discipline loves, but he who hates reproof is, man, you guys did so much better than the first two services. I think, you know, in our home, that's a word we can't say, right? You're not supposed to say the word stupid. But it's interesting because the writer of Proverbs is going out of his way to make sure that we understand something. He says, listen, those who only listen to their own voice, those who always have to be right, those who won't take correction, that they're foolish. That they're, they're literally leading their own lives to destruction. For our purposes, we would say this, these are all things that place a lid on our learning and they keep us from progressing in the faith. They keep us from the things that God has spoken over our lives. So how do we become wise? What does the writer of Proverbs say? What does it look like to be a lifelong learner? Proverbs 9, 9 says this, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The heart of this morning is this, a lifelong learner has a heart to listen to the wise. A lifelong learner has a heart to listen to the wise. Proverbs chapter one, verse five says this, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those who understand receive guidance. It's important that we begin to unpack what it looks like to determine to receive instruction. Let me ask it this way. Who have you intentionally invited into your life to speak into your life? I'm not saying that we let everyone speak in their life. In fact, there's a lot of sources we shouldn't. But who have you intentionally invited into your life? Here, here's one of the things that I know. People aren't just walking around looking and saying, can I mentor you, can I mentor you, can I mentor you? But there's a lot of people in this room, people that are in your spheres of influence, people that you know if you walked up and said, hey, can I take you to coffee, they'd say yes. When I was invited to join the staff of this church the first time, back in 2000. I was 23 years old, it feels like a lifetime ago. It was, it was a lifetime ago. <laughs> I had long hair and no kids. I was invited to, to, to come on staff and I've thought many times, uh, I think Pastor, had t Pastor Traub had temporary insanity because I, I honestly didn't have a lot of skills that I needed to be a youth pastor, but I think he looked and he saw some potential and I'm thankful for that. But I remember in those early days sitting in my office thinking, I've got a name plaque that says, Pastor Ray, I've done some credentialing work and all that stuff. I am 23 years old, I am clueless. <laughs> and so this, I, I, I realized I needed to make some phone calls and ask some questions. And so I began the process of like, I can love people, I can do those things. And I began to allow people to speak into my life. And listen, I wish you could say it was out of some great plan. It was really out of desperation. Help. 
if I don't do some things differently, I am going to be an abject failure. And it's interesting how that, that proving ground can cause us to make some interesting choices. I'm thankful that I had that season to have people with wisdom and experience to speak hard things into my life, to bring correction and direction. So who have we chosen? A lifelong learner has a heart to listen to the wise. So a couple of thoughts. What does that look like? How do we listen to the wise? First thing is this, a lifelong learner is humble. Lifelong learner is humble. Humility is an interesting thing, isn't it? If I were to ask around the room, how many of you are humble? Inherently, in your response of saying you're humble, you wouldn't be. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2 says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. I think one of the important things about humility is this, it's understanding and being comfortable with who God's created you to be. Having an identity rooted in Christ. But here's just a simple question, are you comfortable with who God's created you to be? See, I think often pride comes when we try to pretend we're something we're not. Can I just get something out there? We're all weird. I almost said, look at your neighbor, and I realized we got teenagers in the room. We're all weird. I had someone say this one time, if you walk into a room and everyone in the room is normal, guess what? You're the weird one. Here's the hard part about, we, we talk about want to be normal. Listen, your definition of normal is rooted in what your perceptions are. And if you look around this room this morning, we have a creative God. A God who painted his people with different skin tones and eye colors. A God who gave us creativity differences, who grew up with different foods. And man, we have an incredible God and different influences. And it's in that great diversity that if we will learn to be comfortable with who God has created us to, it opens the door to humility. Pride says I have to pretend to be something that I'm not. Humility says I'm comfortable with the person God has created me to be. You see, this idea of, of, of being someone who's a lifelong learner is rooted in us being willing to be humble. Proverbs 13, 30, or 15, 31 through 33, I didn't put this in your notes, but it says this. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. Remember that verse, I'm gonna talk about that in a couple minutes here. But the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord and humility comes before honor. We must be people that are humble. Do you know the very first step of humility in the Christian walk is to admit that you're a sinner and you need a savior? It's to admit that I can't do this on my own, that someday I'm gonna stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the only hope that I have is to be clothed in his righteousness. I love when we sang that song earlier, right? His righteousness alone, because it helps us to understand that there will be a day when I stand before the King that I will be thankful to be clothed in his righteousness. Nothing that I've done. And it's amazing out of that act, because of what he's done, I respond to serve and to give and to be all that God's called me to be. But it's his righteousness. The first act of humility is to say, God, I can't do this. Humility recognizes that there are those who know more than I do. And I need to learn from them. And humility is birthed out of a deep reverence for God and a willingness to be teachable. It says, God, I trust you. God, you've called me. God, you've said things in my life. God, you've given me promises. Lord God, you've given me dreams and you've given me abilities. God, I, I, instead of complaining and comparing about the things I didn't get, God, I'm gonna be thankful for the things you've given me. But here's the crazy thing in God's word. It says this will be accountable for what was given, not what was given someone else. There's so many parables that Jesus teaches about that, isn't there? He says, listen, the talents you were given, you're, you're accountable for what you were given. So how about you be the best you you can be? And it's rooted in this disciple, discipline of learning 
from God. Second thing is this, how do we do this? A lifelong learner has a desire to grow. Has a desire to grow. Let me ask you this question this morning. Maybe as a Christ follower, have you begun to be stuck? Because listen, leading and growing, they're tough. Sometimes we, we move up a level or up a rung and, 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 and we try to start to coast a little bit. Do we still have a desire to learn? Plus, growth is hard, isn't it? Proverbs 27, 17 says this, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. If you've ever seen that process of iron sharpening iron, there's a lot of sparks that fly, right? It's a process of steel striking steel. It's, it's a sharpening, it's removing the, the coarse edges. It's as one mentor of mine told me one time, I, I don't even remember what the issue was over. I was having an issue with someone else I had a relationship with and I wanted this mentor to say that I was right because I had to be right, right? They obviously had to be wrong. And my mentor just looked at me and said, maybe just maybe God's using them as sandpaper to refine you. That's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I wanted them to be corrected. And yet I began to learn in that moment that a desire to grow will say, listen, there are times when I have to do hard things. Yes. We were designed for relationship and community. There's a guy that I follow, he writes a, almost a daily blog called the Church and Culture Blog. He's a pastor, he's an author. His name is James Emery White. And he publishes this blog called the Church and Culture Blog. And he wrote one this week. And when I read it, I was like, man, I've got to share a part of this because it encapsulated some things that I've recognized over years as a pastor. See, I believe all of you have a desire to grow. And yet when we talk about the things that help you to grow, for instance, we say, hey, listen, we'd love for you to be in a life change group. Like, ooh, commitment, right? Time. Got to find a group of people and what if they're weird and what if, you know, what if they're not weird? What if I'm the weird one? And sometimes we have bad experience and we have difficulty and, and, and we don't even know exactly what it's supposed to look like and it doesn't seem to measure up and then we get our feelings hurt and we go through all these things in life. And here's what he said, I love this. The title of the blog was The Community Fairy Tale. One of the greatest, great myths, greatest myths of, relation, of the relational life is that community is something that's found. In this fairy tale, community is simply out there somewhere waiting to be discovered like Prince Charming finding Cinderella. All you have to do is find the right person or join the right group or get the right job and get involved with the right church. This is why so many people go from relationship to relationship, city to city, job to job, church to church, looking for the community that they think is just around the corner if they could only find the right people in the right place. This thinking permeates our culture. If I have to work at community, relationship in my marriage, my work, my neighborhood, or my church, I must have chosen poorly. Hear me, that idea, that idea is both unrealistic and unbiblical. You know what I discovered? That fairy tales don't happen, they're created. In other words, this, if you want a fairy tale marriage, most marriages fail because people stop working at them. Now, I, you can come, there's, there's examples and there's things. I'm not talking about the outliers. I'm talking about the most, most of the time people stop working. They have a greater desire to be served than to serve. Any married person will tell you, marriage is hard. Business person, like, business is hard. No matter what the sphere of life is, the relational equity, the community, listen, it doesn't just happen. Community doesn't happen because you put two people in a room together. He goes on to say this, and I love, I love this, this visual because I think it helps us understand something. He says this, community is not something you find, it's something you build. And anything you build takes work. Every area of relationship, every area of community must be built. And then he goes on to say this, community is not something discovered, it's something that's forged. I love that visual of, of the Bible stressing that, that, that we're gonna walk through conflict. That that forge looks like dealing with anger and dealing with unteachable spirits and dealing with issues we have in our lives. Real life community looks like people sitting around a table and talking and 
relating to one another and dealing with heart issues. It means conflict's gonna happen. It means we're gonna get our, our feathers ruffled. And the hard part is this, is it never quite has that idealistic picture until you look around and say, what's God doing? Because then once you, once you do the work, once you build it and once you forge it, man, there's something spectacular that's there. When that community is forged, when it's brought together, when you do the hard work, because listen, week after week, showing up, being available. I know often when I talk to a lot of our group leaders, one of the hardest things is being consistent when others aren't. It doesn't just happen. We understand that and we deal with lots of individuals. How do we do that as people? How do we be lifelong learners? Listen, one of the things that God spoke in my life many years ago was always give people the benefit of the doubt. Always assume the best, not the worst. You ever been driving down the road and you wave at somebody and they don't wave back? Yeah, jerk. Get offended. They don't even like me anymore. Why don't even go to church with that person? I kid you not, we were living in a town of 7,000 people in Illinois, North Central Illinois, town of Princeton. I'm driving down the, down the uh, main street one day. Their kind of claim to fame is they have two downtowns. They have row buildings and then you kind of drive some homes and then row buildings. It's kind of weird. Uh, but I'm driving down Main Street one day and my wife's coming the other way. I wave at her, I swerve the car at her a little bit and she just keeps driving. I don't ride with my wife. I'm supposed to say that. I got home later and I said, I said, I said, man, you ignored me earlier. She's like, I didn't see you. I said, I drove past you on Main Street. She's like, no, you didn't. Yeah, 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 I did. Listen, how many realize she wasn't ignoring me? And she'd been someone else I could have assumed, right? Listen, what happens when we begin to give other people the benefit of the doubt? We assume the good, the not the bad. Hey, you know what? She's busy. She's got four kids, at that time, three kids. Last busy things are happening. Maybe, just maybe, she had other things on her mind. She wasn't overly focused on the fact that her husband might be driving up Main Street. It's a small example, but it helps us understand that community's forged, it's built. Last thing this morning is this. Lifelong learner embraces correction. This might be the most difficult one of all. Proverbs 19, 20 says this, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Correction is not easy or natural. No one in this room likes correction, do you? We don't. But I believe the Bible helps us understand something. The enemy wants us to reject correction because we know that correction brings growth. Hear me, correction is not rejection. And I believe this, biblical correction is not passive correction, meaning that someone sees something and they choose to pull us off to the side and correct us. Biblical correction is active correction. It means I've asked someone to speak into my life to help me be better. What do I need to do better? I've given you space. I've asked you. I said earlier, man, the seven years I spent as youth pastor here was such a refining place. It was a place for me to experience. It was also a place for me to make mistakes. More than once I had that conversation. I don't think Pastor Schraub's here this morning. I'll tell this story. More than once I had that conversation where he'd pull me into his office and he would say, we need to talk. Oh, man. <laughs> Loving correction. Listen, he said things to me that no one else was willing to say. Why? Because he cared about me. He wanted me to be better. He, he, wanted, he saw that things needed to change and that, that it would benefit me in the long term. I've talked to so many pastor friends of mine, and not just pastors in other spheres, that never had anyone to speak the hard things into their life. They never called them out. We need people that we've invited into our lives. One of the things, and listen, it's a critique, right? It's to help us. When I was in Bible school, they would tell us that we had to record our messages and watch them. Painful process. No one likes to watch themselves. And listen, you guys are so nice. You know, I, I, you never walk out after a Sunday. And sometimes you walk out as a pastor, you're like, oh boy, Holy Spirit, I hope you do something with that that I didn't do. But no one ever walks up to you and says, pastor, that was a dud this week. Or last week was good, this week, you know, did you study this week? Like, you know. So one of the things, so my wife is that person for me. I don't let her critique every area, but 
easy. But when I want to get a fe- when I want to get feedback, I talk to my wife and say, "Hey, tell tell me what's going on. What what have you noticed?" There's weeks you'll see I was good this week. Message message sent. All right, I got you. Message received. There's other times she'll say, "Hey, you keep repeating this." Why? Because she loves me. She doesn't say it because she wants to be argumentative or difficult. She says it because I understand this: a willingness to experience the pain of correction. In that, you will see fruit. Who have we invited intentionally into our lives? Proverbs 13, 13 through through 14 say this, people who despise advice are asking for trouble. Those who respect a command will succeed. The instruction of the wise are like a life-giving fountain. Those who accept it avoid the snares of death. Listen, this won't just happen. You have to initiate the process. You have to begin to put godly wisdom into practice. You have to understand that that this is about daily improvement. It's not about overnight you're gonna get there. It's about looking back six months, a year from now, and saying, I am a different person than I was then. I've started this process in my life. And if you do it, it'll help the people around you. So here's what I wanna do. Here's how I wanna close. I'm gonna ask all of you, if you would, if you just stand with me. I wanna make this morning incredibly practical. Once you're on your feet, I'm gonna ask you about three different areas, the areas we just talked about. And, and I want you to know this. I'm gonna ask you to raise a hand. Everyone's gonna have their eyes closed. I'm not gonna ask you to come forward after that. This is between you and God. And I wanna pray over you. But if you're a believer in the room, I'm gonna ask you some questions. And I just want you to respond with the Holy Spirit because then I'm gonna have you pray. So where you're at right now, would you just close your eyes? And I want you to make this intently personal. I want you to look at anyone else. I want you to ask yourself this question. First question is this. You say, between, me and, between you and God, you know what? I struggle with pride. I struggle with pride. I know that, I mean, I, I hear what you said, Pastor, but if I'm gonna be honest, man, the humility thing is difficult for me. Nobody's looking, eyes are closed. That's you, you just slip up a hand, uh, straight up and back down, that's me. Thank you, thank you, lots of hands. Between you and the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna, I want you to pray. This, the reason I have you raise your hand is I want you to just take a step of saying, I struggle with that today. Anyone else, that's you, just up and down. How about the community piece? A desire to grow. You have a desire to grow, but you realize that anytime you get into community, it seems like you get offended or hurt. You think it should just be out there and if people just loved you and cared about you and listened, the Holy Spirit would have you, would, would just say to you today, like, it's time to build and forge some community. It's time to fight past a little bit of your anxiety and your worry and realize who God's created you to be. If that's been a stumbling block for you, again, no one looking, eyes closed, just hand up and then hand down. Say, Pastor, pray for me in that. Thank you. Lots of hands. The last one is correction. You would say, you know what, I, Pastor, if I'm gonna be honest, I hate to be corrected. I just, it's hard for me. I, I get offended easily. And, and, and it's just been something that's, that, that's been in my life. And if I'm gonna be honest, I don't really have anyone in my life that I've invited to, to bring active biblical correction. If that's you and you say it's an area you need to prove, just hand straight up and then hand back down. Here's what we're gonna do. I want, you, I want believers in the room if you just begin to pray where you are. Make a personal altar. We're gonna spend about 60 seconds here and I want you to begin to pray. You raised your hand on one of those areas. Would you just allow the Holy Spirit to begin to speak to you? While you're doing that, I wanna talk to anybody in the room right now. You don't know Christ. You're far from him. You walked in today as a guest or maybe you've been here a hundred times, but you don't have a relationship with the Lord today. And you would say, you know, when you were talking earlier about humility and it starts with, with repentance, the first act of humility is to say, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. And if you know today that your testimony is not that you're dressed in the righteousness of Christ and Christ alone, if you've never said you're sorry for your sins, but you know you need to, would you just take a moment right now and just lift a hand and say, pastor, that's me. I don't know Christ as my savior. Thank you. Is there anyone else today? That's me. Nelson needs to raise a hand and say, that's me. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say a prayer together. I don't believe anyone should pray alone. And then I'm gonna pray over you. 
I'm gonna invite the altar team to come and then we're gonna close with one last song. Would you join with me with those who raised their hand today for salvation and repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. I confess today that I'm a sinner and I need you to be my savior. Thank you for dying in my place. And today I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin, to come into my life and change me. Altar team, would you come? We're done worshiping while we're praying. If you, if you wanna respond today, these altars are open. Father, I love you today. Lord, you saw the hands that were raised, God, not to get a count or anything from man, but just to recognize between you and them. Gotta pray for those today that said they struggle with pride. Lord God, we know your word says that pride comes before a fall. Lord God, we, we don't wanna get to that place where we have to be humbled. So Lord God, I pray for those who struggle, Lord God, that today they would learn to humble themselves. And for those who have a desire to grow, Lord God, as we forge and build community, God, God, that we wouldn't be easily offended, God, we would see the good in others, Lord God, that we would not allow the enemy to lie to us, to feed our rejection, but to embrace the community you have for us. And Lord God, I pray, lastly, for those who raised the hand and said, I really have a hard time with correction. God, I thank you, Lord God, that your word says that you discipline those you love. But the writer of Proverbs says that, that, that hard words, words from a friend bring healing. And Lord God, I pray, Lord, over your people today, God, that we would lay down our pride, humble ourselves, embrace community, and God, that we would intentionally seek someone to speak words of life into us. Lord, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.